Hey, sounds good. All right, so we are joined from the shores of the Mississippi River in Wynonna, Minnesota, by my man, Chris Riley, project man product manager at Thurn, which is in Crange there in Minnesota, my high school classmate. Navy That's vet, right. just, just involved in so many things. I got a room full here with me at Velma Jackson. We're recording this for all of our computer science engineering classes in middle schools and high schools in Madison County schools. And um, being a Madison Central alum, it's just so cool for you to be able to do this. And I know you got a presentation for us. So we'll let you uh, go ahead and start because this is really interesting what all you're doing. Okay, well, right on, man. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I certainly appreciate it. Um, and yeah, uh, I think you're absolutely right when you talk about uh, not having to jump right into college uh, after high school, because I tell you what, uh, I know when I graduated from Madison Central, I had no idea what I wanted to do, what I needed to do. Uh, and so the, the military ended up being a path for me. I, I walked into the recruiter's office there on uh, Highway 55 there in Ridgeland, and I said, uh, excuse me, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. If I join the Navy, will somebody tell me what to do and give me food and shelter and money? Uh, and they said, come on, young man, we, ha we have a place for you uh, in the military. But, uh, you know, at the time it seemed interesting and funny, but, uh, you know, it really was the best decision uh, I ever made for my life. I tell you what, uh, I'm uh, not only am I an alumni of uh, Madison Central High School, I'm also an alumni of the Madison County uh, Alternative School. So uh, a two-time <laughs> uh, alumni. Uh, well, to be you know, our, our alternative school class is going to see this as well. So, you know, I, I don't good. want them to feel left out because, you know, you know, yep. you're a perfect example. You were at the alternative school, but, you know, just because you're there doesn't mean that that's the end of the line for you. Those that's students right. are just as important as everybody else. Yeah, that's right, man. And so, um, you know, ab about two months after uh, I graduated from Madison Central there, I, I joined the Navy, uh, which was great for me because I tell you, I wasn't uh, – super great at school. But if you look at my timeline of events that I have down here, the first thing they did was uh, send me to school for two years. And I was like, oh, great. I guess I didn't really understand that was going to happen because I, <laughs> I wasn't super great at school. But uh, it turns out when they pay you money and, and uh, you know, you're getting yelled at by folks every now and then, you know, I just I was all about doing what I needed to do when I was in the military. So, you know, just give me the checklist, tell me what I'm supposed to do and I'll do that stuff. So I ended up uh, doing pretty well uh, in my Navy school for the first two years. And they actually invited me to stay on as a staff instructor. So uh, I spent uh, a total of the first four years I was in the Navy, either in school or teaching others. You can kind of think about uh, my second two years there as like a graduate assistant uh, at a college, right? You do really well. And the instructor was like, man, you know, all kinds of stuff. Stay here and teach with us for a little bit. So I did that. Uh, that was a really great experience for me. Um, and then I was deployed on the USS Rhode Island, which is a Trident submarine out of Kings Bay, Georgia. Um, future, uh, and so that's uh, the type of submarine that carries nuclear missiles from around the world. So uh, it's kind of thought of as a, a Cold War era weapon. Uh, for wow. our military, but uh, strategic nuclear deterrence is uh, is a very important part of uh, protecting the United States. So did that for about four years. We did six total deployments uh, while I was on the ship. It was uh, a very interesting time. Uh, just imagine uh, 180 of your buddies coming to all, you all come to school one day and you just shut the doors for about four months and don't talk to anybody and just drive around the ocean and do fun things. <laughs> Um, so that was super interesting. And then I spent my last three years in the Navy on instructor duty again. So I went back to the same instructor duty station, spent my last three, four years uh, teaching others how to do what I did, uh, which is I worked in, uh, I was a mechanic and I worked on the submarines nuclear power plants. So I'll show you guys a little bit wow. more about that. Um, and kind of at that time, as I was winding down my, you know, 10th and 11th year in the military, I knew I didn't necessarily want to go work in nuclear power. Um, you know, when, once I got out of the Navy, so I said, well, you know, I can't change the fact that I have 11 years worth of work experience in nuclear power. Um, so I'm going to go to college. Uh, the military has a whole bunch of free money and a bunch of great programs, uh, and they all helped me go to college. And so I, I ended up spending a couple of years working at a civilian nuclear power plant once I got out of the service. Um, and now I actually work in product marketing uh, and, and in sales. So I'll talk a little bit about how I got to do that. Um, and just some brief information about what's going on in the military and on U.S. submarines. And so um, if you guys are unaware, the United States is one of the few world powers that have nuclear missiles uh, to defend our nation. You know, we haven't dropped a nuclear bomb on anything on the entire planet since uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which I'm sure you guys learned all about in history class. But the sheer fact that we have these weapons is a big deterrent from anybody messing with us. 
Um, and so we have these weapons in a couple different places. We can either launch them from airplanes. We can launch them from silos in the ground, which are hidden in like the Dakotas and out in Colorado where NORAD is, um, or our most survivable leg of the nuclear triad. So kind of what that means is if uh, the whole world were to go crazy and Russia were to launch their weapons and then we launch our weapons and then China launches their weapons and there's nuclear weapons everywhere, the only thing that's going to survive are the submarines that are hidden uh, under the water out at sea because nobody's launching uh, missiles into the middle of the ocean at things they can't see. Um, so it was a really interesting time and certainly a, a great, great part of defending freedom and democracy in this country. And it was an interesting way to do it. Um, living on yeah, a And submarine. I think that's a good point because, you know, you, 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 these kids here military and all they think is the stuff they see on the movies. It's oh, not right. just kick down doors and let's shoot people and blow stuff up. I mean, obviously, if you want to do that, they can find a place for you. But there is such a big need for scientists and engineers and people with with uh, trade skills on these oh, yeah. on these machines and uh in in every branch but especially in the navy on these sea baron not on these sea baron vessels yeah yeah and if you kind of look at the little uh schematic that's listed at the top here this is kind of the back end it's a, a simplified representation of what the back end of a submarine looks like and and wow uh, you know you see things on here you've got your you got your new nuclear reactor which is really just a hot rock that boils water and we use that water to spin uh to make steam and it spins the turbines uh, that make electricity for the boat. It spins the turbines that provide propulsion for the boat. And then there's a whole host of equipment uh, that I was required to maintain as a mechanic on that ship. So I got all kinds of technical skills. I worked on turbines, pumps, breakers, valves. I learned all kinds of things about maintenance programs and how to maintain equipment in general. Uh, because obviously, you know, out in the civilian sector, we don't have a lot of submarines around you can go work at, but lots of places <laughs> have equipment to work on, right? And we always need people to work on equipment. We have a whole maintenance department here at the factory that I work at. I could probably go in. I mean, my mechanical okay, skills aren't what they use, um, but they're still pretty good. And then beyond the technical skills I got in the military, I tell you what, as I was looking for jobs out in the civilian sector, there's a whole lot of things beyond the technical skills that the private sector looks for that you get from being in the military. And that's things like showing up to work on time, being loyal, understanding how to work in a team or how to lead people or how to delegate authority. And no matter what you go to do in the military, these are skills that uh, you definitely go to pick up and that employers are, are certainly uh, looking for. So um, not only are there just technical skills out the wazoo to be gained in the military, there's also a lot of soft skills to be gained and employers are looking for those things uh, in, in this day and age. And I'm, I'm um, glad you mentioned that too, because one thing I always say is, you know, in the in civilian or obviously in the military world, you don't get to choose your coworkers. But to be successful, you have to be able to work with everybody. And these, these kids, to to I, I got a, I got a, I got a group here with me now. All great kids, all very intelligent. But it's like pulling teeth because they never want to work together. They just want to do stuff on their own. You know, yeah, man. You can be successful on your own, but the teams that work together become uh, successful more, uh, more swiftly. Yeah, and uh, you know, I tell you what, uh, joining the service, uh, you meet people from all walks of life. I had folks in my division that were not from this country that earned their citizenship as part of serving uh, our country while they were on the ship. Uh, I met folks wow. from all over the world and all over the country. And you're exactly right; you work with who you work with, man. And and I, you know, as I look back on those things and meeting folks from all walks of life, I have zero bad memories. I loved everybody I worked with, man. It was a really, it was a really good time. So. Um, you know, it, I, I'm a big proponent of the service. You know, I was happy to get out and tired by the time I was done. But again, it was the best decision I ever made. Um, and, you know, beyond those skills that I gained, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, as I was getting out of the service, I started going to college and then I continued uh, for a few years after I got out of the service. And uh, all in all, I got uh, quite a bit of education to put on my resume. I got an undergraduate degree from SUNY Empire State <laughs> College in business management. And then uh, about a year after I got out, I finished my MBA, which I got from Cardinal Stritch University, which unfortunately just closed down due to low yeah, enrollment. I saw that. It's yeah. out of the Milwaukee area. And then um, I also uh, attended two executive education programs, one at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business, which is an Ivy League school in Pennsylvania. And wow. uh, the University of St. Thomas, which is a smaller <laughs> private school here in the Twin Cities areas. Uh, yeah, just went to Division I. They just switched to Division One sports recently. Yes, they did. Um, <laughs> and so I did some postgraduate studies there. And for my total out-of-pocket expenses for all of this stuff, only because I was a veteran in the U.S. Navy, uh, was zero dollars. Um, wow. So 
I've got degrees out the wall. I mean, I don't use a ton of this stuff. And, you know, a lot of times I just, I really wanted that check in the box because at some point I was like, you know, I would hate to lose out on an opportunity one day because, yeah. you know, I didn't read some books and check somebody's box. But, you know, uh, in addition, not a lot of folks in my family went to college, man. Uh, and so uh, to me, walking across the stage and and uh, being honored with something that was nothing but my blood, sweat and tears and my hard work. And it was something that nobody could take away from me. And it was something that I really wanted to do. So I'm glad I got Absolutely. to do those things. Uh, and I tell you what, I have an older sister. She's seven years older than me. Uh, and she uh, she's actually a graduate of Millsaps College down there in Jackson. Um, she still pays student loans. Uh, and that was also something that I did not want to be saddled with. I mean, college is uh, it was expensive 20 years ago and it's even more expensive now, man. And, uh, you know, I, my mama didn't have any money to send me to school. And so, um, you know, this was uh, this was the best thing for me, man. I've got no student loans. And, uh, you know, I, I had a different path to get to where I'm at today. Um, and, awesome. uh, you know, I really enjoy it. And so that's kind of my career path as a whole, just to highlight some of the cool things that what I do now. So, you know, I spent all this time in the military. Uh, I got all these technical skills and then I went and got all these business degrees. And, and it took me a couple of, of stepping stones to get here. But now my job is to be a product uh, manager. So kind of what I do for my company, Third Incorporated, which makes anything from a hand winch that you might see on a boat trailer to very large industrial winches is uh, I kind of work with our sales team to understand the kind of products that uh, our customers want. And then I work with the engineering team because I speak very good engineering from all the technical skills that I have. Um, to say, hey, this is how we need to design these products. And so um, some of the cooler projects that we have worked on here at this little company on the banks of uh, the Mississippi River, about 1200 miles river north of you guys, is um, we built a couple of two big winches that go on uh, one of the platforms for NASA for the space shuttle. And so wow. these winches pull this platform uh, in and out of position. That was a really cool project that we worked on uh, for the government. Uh, our claim to fame is the Times Square Ball. So I'm sure everybody's familiar with the Times Square Ball and the Times Square Balls drops on New Year's Eve. Uh, well, underneath the pole where that Times Square Ball sits is an underhung thern winch that raises and lowers that ball. So not wow. to toot my own horn, but New Year's Eve doesn't happen without my company. I'm just saying we'd all be stuck <laughs> in, at the end of the year uh, if our company uh, didn't exist. So um, this hangs under the Times Square Ball. And one of the and this was actually just this year. Uh, we made a bunch of winches for a customer who was setting up the stage for the NFL draft. So uh, you can see a row of them here. That's eight of them. We actually made 16 total, along with all of the electrical controls to go with it. So, you know, even for a small company, we have opportunities here for welders, painters, business people, finance people. And we have our whole in-house engineering group here at this small $20 million company uh, in, uh, in Minnesota. And so yeah, and you guys make the rope as well, too, right? Absolutely. Yep. Um, and these winches for the NFL draft stage, if you look at the picture on the left, uh, that grid work that you see at ground level is actually the ceiling for the stage. And each one of our winches kind of goes periodically where those grids cross uh, wow. and raises that whole ceiling up, which is kind of what you see in the second picture. And then this was the actual stage, which was set up in Kansas City this year uh, and what it looked like. I tell you guys, I watched the entire NFL draft leaning up in my TV like this, trying to see if I could see any of our winches uh, up in the ceiling because I actually, uh, you know, we're, we're a small company. And uh, one day we were just backed up and we had to get these winches out the door and was like, does anybody know how to test uh, equipment because we don't have any production people to do it. And I said, are there directions? Uh, because if there's one thing I know how to do is to take a piece of paper and follow the directions. The military trained me to do this. No problem. And so I got to test all these winches, make sure they worked good before we shipped them out to the customers. So uh, that was also a, a pretty neat project that we got to work on. Um, so that's kind of all this, the the stuff I had to talk about, Greg. Does uh, does your team have any questions? Oh yeah, I, I mean, I, I had some, I, I had some stuff. Um, right. I, I tell you, um, one thing I think is so cool is that you know you mentioned uh, about all the different skills that are in these engineering firms or these yeah. engineering companies. You know, um, if you know, and you and we, and we, and we, you know, you really hit on the different uh, options after high school. So. And, you know, you know, we have these community colleges here that do a great job of teaching trades. Someone oh, like Thurn, you know, you, you're probably looking for somebody that can handle equipment, that can weld, that can uh, that has that associates or, or, or technical certificate. And they're making pretty good money. 
So it's, oh, you know, yeah. I don't want somebody to feel like, you know, my family can't afford to send me to college. My grades aren't spectacular. If you have these engineering skills, you can learn in eighth grade. And now, and we didn't have when we were in school, you know, I always tell whenever I have alumni, you know, these kids don't know how lucky they are. We went to Madison Central. We did not have, first of all, somebody talked to us about this. Second, yeah. we didn't have the engineering program that we now have at the MCTC, our career center. And also we have one on campus at Ridgeland High School. So these kids could start getting engineering certifications in high school and start working in engineering firms while they're going to school and get uh, associates in engineering and um, really work their way up. And they getting work experience and they're going to kind of go to the front of the line on these jobs. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. I tell you what, we do career fairs uh, here. Our HR folks go out to the two technical colleges that we have right here in town. Uh, and we do uh, businesses with local high schools, too, just to, so when students are graduating in this area, hey, this is who we are. These are the types of skills we have. And you're exactly right. Even our engineering department, it is not everybody with four year engineering degrees. We have guys with technical certificates that know how to do drafting and design and stuff on computers. Uh, and we have guys up there with no degrees who just maybe spent 10 years doing something technical. Uh, and we bring them here, man. We're like, hey, do you think you can test winches and cranes and follow directions and do these things? Um, and so we have all kinds of opportunities available. And uh, what I always think is interesting, especially when it comes to trades, is uh, if I look at our welding department, for example, yes, we have 12 people that have their own welding cells with their Miller welder and a gun, but we also have a welding robot here. And those are two different oh. uh, skills, right? So you might, you know, you may, you have one guy who's very, very good at uh, manual hand welding. And then we have another guy who was very good at going to a school to learn how to program a, a robot that does welding, but that guy still has to have welding knowledge and skill. Um, and so you're absolutely right. And we bring in interns here and we give them welding experience while they're in school. You know, maybe they're in a techno school and they're off for the summer. Um, but you're exactly right, man. Anything you can do um, to prove that you have skills or get certifications, especially when you're young and competing in the workforce, first trying to get your foot in the door at a company, uh, it's going to do nothing but be beneficial to you. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned drafting because Holmes Community College has a great drafting program that has turned mm -hmm. out some Ph.D. engineers. Um, and that, that's a great stepping stone, you know, to get that one on one work with these engineering teachers. And that can land you an awesome, uh, at least a part time foot in the door job while you're getting your 40 year degree. Yeah, man. And I tell you what, you know, I look at it and uh, my current position, I don't have anybody that works for me, but I've done a lot of hiring uh, and looking at individuals. And I can tell you, um, when you look at somebody's resume who's young and doesn't have a ton of work experience, when you can see, hey, when I was in high school, I was taking college courses or I got certified before I even got out of high school. Those are, uh, you know, indicative of somebody you want on your team. Doesn't really matter what the skill is. Somebody who is willing to take the initiative and willing to work hard and, and get those certifications early. I mean, I don't think that person is going to grow up to be somebody who's worked at your company for 15 years and then just falls off the wagon. Right. I mean, these are good people <laughs> who do good things and make good choices. And that stuff's all great. Yeah, and now, and I think I can speak for all the other teachers that'll see this later. Um, whenever we are, you know, we have projects and then we build things in class and these kids, they always, you know, they mess up one time. Oh, this is too hard. I quit. Mm -hmm. uh, how often do people in engineering get it right the first time? Oh, zero percent of the time. And I can tell you, we have uh, a couple of new product development projects that have been in the works for like three years. And every time we're like, OK, let's put this thing together. We're going to put it on our test stand. And then we start we turn it on and it, pfft, the circuit board fries. And we're like, oh, all right, what did we do wrong here? Right. And we have a, a motto here and it's not and, you know, it and it's not something that's unheard of. I and mean, we just call it fail forward. Right. Like sometimes you just have to try some things. It may or may not work. But how else are you going to figure it out until you get it wrong? Right. Sometimes you're just not going to find the right answer until you get it wrong 13 times. Um, and being able to overcome those kinds of obstacles is also something that employers are looking for. Right. Are you going to be the guy that gives up the first time and is always like, hey, what am I supposed to do? Or are you going to be the guy that comes in and says, hey, we had the circuit board burn up. I need to buy four more resistors. And then next week, I'm going to be ready to try this again. Right. Um, and so all those things are great. But yeah, from an engineering standpoint, especially when it comes to product development, or developing something new uh, that's never been done before, you have all kinds of failures. And that's fine. Um, you know, just uh, learn what you can learn and move forward. Yeah. And now and also, you know, because I, I know the RJROTC people are going to want to hear about some military stuff. But one thing sure. I had a military guest last week and we talked about this. You know, again, you know, all a lot of kids see is what they see in the movies. And, you know, everybody's seen Full Metal Jacket and they think that um, 
that uh, that boot camp is like that. And the basic training is, you know, people are screaming at you constantly. You're, you know, you're on death's door <laughs> physically. And, it, you know, and, it, and, you know, and let's not lie, it is physically tough. But yep. what I've tried to understand is, what I try to get these kids to understand, these military these military branches want you to succeed. These military yeah. branches want young people to learn these skills. People are retiring every day. They need to fill these jobs. People that don't have technology experience are getting older. They need young people that have these skills and have these certifications to move into these jobs. So I, I don't want to detour. You know, I hear people say all the time, well, the military would be fun, but I don't want to get yelled at or I don't want to cut my hair. When one, you're getting paid to learn, and then two, yeah. you're going to be able to move up quickly because of your intelligence and your ability to learn these new, uh, all this new te technology advances. Because especially in the Navy and, and yeah. what you're doing on submarine, those software systems are changing every day. Every day, yeah. You know what? And and hair grows back. Uh, and, and you're and you're right in that the military wants everybody to succeed. Don't forget our our armed services are 100% volunteer. We don't draft people and make them serve X amount of time in the military. Um, and so, you know, I used to always, uh, you know, I think like all walks of life, you get all types of people in the military. And I used to just tell the complainers, I'm like, stop complaining, man. You volunteered to be here. And not only did you volunteer to be in the military, but you have to volunteer again to be on submarine duty. Um, they don't, you know, they're not going to make anybody go be on a submarine. You join a Navy and say, I can't, I can't, I cannot live on a submarine underwater. They're not going to make anybody do that because it is kind of. I mean, it's an interesting way of life. I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's good stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the submarine force is changing. And you're absolutely right about all the technical skills you can get in the military. And and yeah, uh, boot camp's a, a little, I mean, it's a wake up call. Uh, but again, I just did what I was told. It was like the easiest thing to do. They said, wake up, make your bed. I'm like, okay, no problem. Wake up, make my bed. Oh, you didn't do it right. And then just don't worry. You're never going to do it right. And they'll yell at you anyway, but whatever, man, it's over in like eight weeks. And then you get to go do fun stuff, see the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing, you know, I hear kids say all the time, you know, I want to get out of Mississippi and I'm always like, okay, you want to live in these big cities, mm -hmm. big city living has big city bills. Mm -hmm. No, there's in my opinion. And again, this is just my opinion. There's no better way to see the world than in the military. And especially in the Navy, the Navy yep. might be the most traveling armed service there is. Um, yeah. Especially if you're on the boat or on the submarine. Yep. And uh, I've got, you know, I've still got friends in the service right now. I have friends that live in Guam. I have friends that live in Yokosuka, Japan. Hawaii has a massive submarine base. So I've known guys that have spent their whole career in Hawaii. They go out to Hawaii and they go on deployment and then, you know, they leave their wife and kids and stuff at home. And then they're like, hey, why don't we move back to the States or whatever? And their wife and kids are like, no, we live in Hawaii. Why would I want to move back to Utah or Mississippi or whatever it is? Um, and so I know folks that have just lived in Hawaii forever. Um, and, and yeah, you get, you get to see the world. You get, yeah, I know, right? Uh, we actually, and, you know, it wasn't like this way when I was a kid, but I went trick-or-treating with my kids last night. And we had about three inches of snow on the ground. Uh, growing up in Mississippi, I used to always sweat all my makeup and stuff off. And here I got to put four layers on my four kids just to get them outside uh, long enough to trick-or-treat, so. Dead gum. Um, okay. Now, before I get to the students' questions, I did. I did want to talk a little bit about obviously what Thern does with these machines, um, mm -hmm. and even building, you know, cranes, winches, rigging. That's all simple stuff, but it's stuff that has to change every day. People are always looking for simpler ways to make things, more efficient ways to make things, safer ways to make things. So, yeah. as you're developing these products, um, what are some things that you're having to think about and and change? Because obviously, you know, you, you saw, we saw the. Um, the uh the pull uh, the pulleys on the uh, on the platform um mm -hmm. that's not something that's going to be the same five years from now so what are some things you're always looking for to develop with these because simple machines is a huge part of our curriculum and it's a huge part of everyday engineering yeah it it certainly is and I tell you one of the other um big industries that we get into is uh, if you guys have a performing arts center uh, at your high school and you have backdrops that can move up and down. Uh, we also make counterweight rigging systems for theaters and uh, middle schools and high schools are our bread and butter. And I tell you what, um, there's nothing more concerning to an architect designing uh, a space like that for high school students than the safety of those students. Um, so if you were to look at any of the big red Thern equipment on our website, you'd see a little disclaimer that says uh, not for lifting people or things over people. And those types of things are designed very differently than anything we're going to put in a high school, which is literally going to hold stuff over people's heads. Uh, we have to design a lot of technology into those products. They got to have 
like two different brakes on it to ensure if one brake fails, you know, that whole loads or, you know, that backdrop's not going to come crashing down on a student's head. Um, and so that technology changes all of the time. We have to put positioning controls on our stuff. So we know exactly if that backdrop is at 10 feet or if it's at 20 feet and if it's going to move and does it have emergency stops or there are multiple control stations. And so um, definitely from a control standpoint, from that avenue, there's always stuff changing. I don't think there's ever going to be you know, I think every two to three years, almost every piece of electronics that we purchase from a vendor for our products is outdated and not sold anymore. Um, so wow. then we have, wow, well, we're going to have to get this new circuit board and does it have the same requirements and can it talk to our software and, you know, can we do all of these things? Um, and then, yeah, even on the industrial side, uh, you know, we see a lot of different things. We see a lot of customers who come to us and say, hey, I want one of your Davit cranes, but I need it to comply and, you know, I work in the marine industry and we have this marine industry standard that says you have to meet all these requirements to use a crane on our ship or whatever. And so now we have to take those requirements, which are always changing, apply them to our products and say, you know, does it have a safety factor of X? Can it pick up this much stuff? Does it move in this way? Does it move in that way? How big is it? Um, and so product reviews and product designs are almost always driven by our customers. And uh, when it comes to safety and technology, you're right, those things are always changing um, and I think like every company uh, in this day and age, you know, we have a, a group of uh, older individuals who are probably due to retire within the next four five, six years. And we're always looking for those younger folks to come in who have a, one, a handle and formal training on new technologies, uh, but who are willing to learn all the stuff that's like tribal knowledge in our current set of engineers heads. Absolutely. I mean, you got to have a good mix of all that. Um, mm -hmm. But I do, I got some questions from the students and I'll get to as many of these as I can. Um, sure. This is Takibi Boyd. He's a sophomore, really interested in video game design, but this is a great question. He asked, what is the most under misunderstood part about your profession? So the misunderstood uh, part about my profession, well, that's a really, uh, that's some really good question. So I'll talk about my uh, myself individually there. So, you know, uh, I think a lot of times, People think that product managers are like, hey, you're an engineer and we're designing products and, and you know, we're going out there, you know, here we are as a smart company designing this thing. It's going to work great. Uh, and then we put it out to the market and we see what happens. But in actuality, you know, I think the most important part of my job is being a people person and being able to pick up the phone and call our customers and say, hey, what is it that that the market really wants and what is it that they really need? And so, you know, while I have all of this technical experience. Um, I've worked with engineers my whole life. I, I sit right in between an engineering group and a sales group. Ultimately, my job is to understand people. Uh, I work on product development teams uh, that are wide ranging. So at my company, nobody works for me, but I'm responsible for driving project teams made up of a whole bunch of other people who don't work for me. So I don't know how often you guys have tried to get people who like at work who don't work for you to do things for you. It's not super easy. Um, and, you know, because everybody's got their own, you know, agenda or, or goals and objectives or whatever at work. Um, and so I think a lot of people kind of fail to understand that they go and they get all these skills and you kind of forget that the most complicated thing you're ever going to do is try to figure out what's wrong with your coworkers. I think, man, people are more complicated uh, than, than machines any day of the week. Um, so yeah. And, and you mentioned something else there. You mentioned something else there that I, I'm glad you did because these kids, and I, again, I can speak for all the teachers on this one. These mm -hmm. kids want to act like we are pulling teeth when we want them to present something. Um, and yeah. obviously we're not expecting everybody to be public speakers. Everybody's not for that. I mean, me and, I yeah. mean, I can speak for thousands of people, but everybody's different. But everybody's different. at the end of the day, if you're going to do business, and if you're going to work together, you have to be able to communicate, whether it be whether it's an engineering or not. You know, and I know you deal with some sales. If you're going to talk uh -huh. to a customer, if you're going to take somebody's money, you better know what you're selling them. You better yeah. know what you're talking about. So even if somebody, you know, we have young ladies that want to do hair. That's great. But you better be able to tell somebody how you're going to cut their hair and how it's going to look. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. it, you know, you know when, that, when we ask these kids to talk, you know, and, you know, TikTok and all that stuff's fun. But uh, you, you got to be able to communicate effectively and especially in your field where you're the expert you have to yep. be able to explain to a customer here's what you're getting from us here's what it's going to cost and here's your return on investment yeah you know and it's really interesting you bring up that thing about public speaking because uh public speaking is the number one fear in the world number two being death 
Uh, so people would literally rather be in the casket than give the eulogy at a funeral, <laughs> which I always find uh, super interesting. But I'll tell you what, you know, having spent four, five, six years as an instructor in the military, and then when I went to work at a commercial plant, I was an operations instructor, and then I ended up being a training manager. And all of these things involve giving presentations, which I haven't always necessarily liked, and I did not want to work in training forever. But I tell you what, if I need to explain something in simple terms so that a customer can understand it, or if I need to explain a complex technical problem to the CEO who's not an engineer at my company, I'm an excellent communicator. And I can just, and you know, if the CEO is like, hey, man, I just don't get it. I'll break it down into three or four parts. Here's the you understand A, B, and C. And these were all skills that I picked up from being an instructor and just over and over and over having to stand in front of a, a room full of people and pretend like I know what I'm talking about, which 90% of the time I don't, but I can memorize things super well and I'm convincing <laughs> and charismatic. So, uh, you know, you got to fake it till you make it sometimes, I suppose. Absolutely. Uh, I like this one. This is Rondale Ellis. He's in ninth grade. And he asked, during your journey, what is your favorite memory when you look back at all the obstacles you faced? Yeah, you know, I guess um, it's a great question. You know, when I look back on it, uh, to be honest with you guys, um, I didn't think I was just ever going to be super successful. Um, you know, raised by a single mom, ha had enough money to put food and, you know, rent and stuff on the table. But Knew I wasn't going to go to college, didn't really know what I wanted to do in life. Uh, and so to just, you know, sit here now and just be semi-successful, having looked back and saying, you know, I accomplished all of these things, uh, you know, I think is super great. Um, I did not realize um, the profound impact uh, being in the military would have on just my personal thoughts about myself. Like when I look back on, you know, if people ask me about my time in the service, you know, I'm oftentimes not saying, Hey, you know, I, I worked on nuclear things or I was a mechanic. I just tell people, you know, I was part of a team. I defended freedom. I defended democracy. I was part of something that was bigger than myself. Uh, and so to just have kind of have gone on and done those things and being able to look back on my life and go, you know, when I was an 18 year old knucklehead, boy, I made a really good decision uh, when I joined the Navy, man. And, and at the time, it just felt like what I needed to do. Um, but now I look back and I'm like, boy, I'm glad I, I fell into that and made a good choice at that time. Yeah. And, and it's like, I, you know, and, you know, I, we had Michelle open yesterday in a different class and we all agree. You know, we all came through high school together. We were mm -hmm. at Madison Central. We were sitting where a lot of these kids are sitting now. Mm -hmm. Nobody took the time to explain this to us. Um, I, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of regrets in my life, but I, you know, I probably would have done some things differently if all the options would have been presented to me. Now that doesn't yeah. mean I made the wrong decisions, but I wish I'd have had more choices when I was 18. So, yeah. and, and I'm glad that, you know, and I'm super happy for you because you deserve everything you've gotten by making that decision after high school, because, you know, there's people in similar situations that have the single parent that, you know, they don't have a whole lot of money. They're worried about going there. They can still yeah. have an incredibly successful career, serve our country, Absolutely. travel the world and make a really good living on top of that. Absolutely. Um, this is Krishan Smith, one of our football players. He's a sophomore. Ooh, and he nice. asks, when you're designing things and you make mistakes, what is the most common thing you see when you're making a mistake? Yeah, you know, uh, I think design mistakes can be put into a couple of different categories. So sometimes you have a design mistake where the machine uh, works exactly like you want it to, um, but the feature or the benefit isn't there, right? So let's say you build a feature into a machine because it's supposed to make the end, you hey, it's supposed to make this thing easier to use. Uh, but you may not really understand that because you're not the end user and you're not the one using it that way every day. Um and so oftentimes we make engineering or design mistakes by misunderstanding what it is the customer wanted or what the utility of the feature might be. Uh, and then other times, um, you know, you have design errors where the machine doesn't function correctly. And, you know, a lot of those times uh, it's around the trial and error thing. So you may design something spatially like we design. I mean, basically we make big fishing reels here, right? Instead of reeling up fishing line, we're reeling up big fat cables on it. Um, and so that cable goes in all kinds of different directions, especially when it's in the machine. And so oftentimes we find, oh, we didn't get this clearance right. Um, sometimes you might find out that you're using an unsuitable material, uh, a, so a metal that's too soft or a metal that's too weak. Um, but you do all kinds of testing to kind of verify these things. And so sometimes those things come out in testing 
you know, we put something together and feel like, hey, this is supposed to lift 100 pounds and we're using steel, so it's all good. Well, we had this one aluminum O-ring or this one aluminum gear that wasn't rated for that. Uh, and it may not be ca caught in design or in calculations, but, uh, you know, that's why design is design and calculations have to be proven out, right? So if you calculate, hey, this winch should be able to lift up a thousand pounds, you still have to test that, right? You can do all the calculations in the world, but all those commuter computer models and stuff are built on assumptions. Uh, and assumptions don't often, I'm sorry, assumptions sometimes don't reflect the reality of the situation of the design. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you mentioned materials. You know, it's hard in high school we don't really have the budget to have all, all sorts of materials. The design part is very important, but when you're coming, when, you know, especially when you're talking about lifts and winches and cranes in any type of metals, you got to look at the weight, you got to look at the weather conditions. All that is Absolutely. extremely important on how it wear, how the, you know, the wear on the weather, the, even if it's underwater. So that's mm -hmm. so, you know, the scientific aspect is also very important with the testing of the material. So I'm glad you mentioned that. That's not something we yeah. were able to do a whole lot in high school, but that's something that really has to be thought about in the design process. Absolutely. And uh, we think about that, um, you know, as we make stuff, um, our, our main base materials that we use here are regular mild steel, which uh, obviously has iron in it, will rust and corrode. So we think about the finishes that we might put on that, whether it be painting or powder coating. But then we have customers who are like, no, I cannot have a crane made out of metal that will rust, in which case we might use stainless steel or we might use aluminum. But aluminum is a much weaker metal than steel. So, you know, you've got some drawbacks there. How big do you have to make it? How long do you have to make it? And so there's always some give or take when you talk about working uh, on different materials. Uh, we're not quite at the point in our little small company where the materials and their uses. There's a whole lot going on there when you start talking about composite materials and, and you know, stuff that's not naturally found in the earth that scientists are making in plants and stuff. Um, so we got a lot of research to do there. But, uh, you know, those materials tend to be a little bit lighter and they have uh, other benefits. So we're trying to get there, um, but we are a small company. We don't have a ton of resources. Um, so we do the best we can with what we got, which is, I think, what we're all trying to do all the time. Absolutely. I just got one more. This is Michael Sherrill. He's uh, also one of our football players. He's in, uh, a sophomore. And he asked, of all the things you deal with every day, what is the hardest part of your job? It's people. <laughs> um, no doubt. It's just people. And, you know, it's funny. I, you know, I've worked at some Fortune 500 companies. And, you know, this company here, we've got 112 people that work here. And I like everybody that works here. We don't have any shady stuff going on. Nobody's sneaky. <laughs> nobody's playing inner office politics or any of that uh, garbage. But it is still very hard to just corral a group of people and get them to do what you want to do. You know, I've taught a lot of, of classes on leadership and, uh, you know, leadership, whether you're talking about uh, you know, Jack Welch in the boardroom, Martin Luther King as a civil rights leader uh, or, you know, General Patton on the battlefield. There's all kinds of leadership, but leadership is really just about one thing. It's about getting a group of people to achieve a common goal. Um, and that is not easy. I have seen some of the smartest people on the planet not be able to lead a group of people out of a paper bag. Uh, and then I have seen some of the, you know, folks with no college degrees, no education, they are just the best people leaders you have ever seen in your life. And, and I tell you what, when it comes to technical things, I mean, there's always an answer. There's an engineer or there's a book or there's a thing or you can test it. You can't do any of that stuff with people. People are so complicated. <laughs> they really are. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, well, we're almost out of time. Uh, and we thank you. I mean, this is such such great stuff. But before we go, I do have a couple of questions. One sure. funny and one serious. Good. Um, all right, the first one, you know, we've known each other almost 30 years now, and it's amazing yeah. how much how old we're getting. Um, and I, these kids love making fun of me. They love getting things about me. Um, yeah. But we've known each other since we were 12 years old. Um, ha have I not still the goofiest person that I was when I was in middle school? You are exactly the same person. You're exactly the same person with a little more facial hair, I'd say. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Yeah, they, yeah. Th these kids love hearing that. So I, I don't mind being the butt of the jokes. I know it, it comes with the territory. Um, mm -hmm. But before we go, you know, uh, you know, a lot of kids are going to see this. Um, you know, you went to Madison Central. You were sitting right here mm -hmm. in Madison County School, just like these kids were. And you said yourself, you had a single parent. You really, you know, your family you know, was was getting by. There's a lot of kids that may be in that same situation. And even if they really don't want to get in the tech or engineering area, maybe they're kind of eh, on the military. You know, you're a perfect example of no matter what your circumstance, you can be extremely successful. So with these yeah, kids man. that are growing up and, and, and have more, you know, now they get free, free ACTs. Where was that when we needed it? But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, you know, th they have these resources now, the same things we had and a lot more. But 
they shouldn't give up because you're a perfect example of how successful you can be no matter where you come from. So what can these yeah. kids do to get ready for those obstacles that they may already be facing or that they're going to face? Yeah. You know, I tell you guys, um, I, I, I had a plan where I wanted to go, you know, I, I, as, uh, as I was getting out of the military, you know, I, I knew I didn't want to work in nuclear power forever. Uh, and I just set myself small goals, right? I wanted to start working on my associate's degree. And then I had to, to work with my school to develop a program to get a bachelor's degree. And then, uh, you know, I thought, you know, once I was there, I was like, oh, look at me. I have this, you know, I have this bachelor's degree. I can go do whatever I want to do. Uh, and, and I found that that wasn't necessarily the case because my education and my work experience didn't line. So I set myself another goal. I said, well, I can't control the fact that, you know, the past 11 years I've been doing X, Y, and Z, but I can get more education. Um, and so, you know, I've always just tried to worry about the things that I can control and not worry about the things that I can't do anything about. I can't do anything about where I come from. I can't do anything about when I was young. I didn't have any money. I just didn't have any of those things. But I had a pretty good nose for understanding what I could control. Uh, and for me, I could definitely step onto an airplane and go be in the military. There wasn't anything stopping me from doing that. And, uh, you know, I think that's what it's all about, man. Just just understand where it is you want to go um and 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 make yourself small achievable goals to get there because uh you know again um i i kind of felt my my own opinion of myself was that i was on a path to nowhere uh at one point and i just woke up one day and i said this is not for me man uh, i need to do some other things i need to make some positive choices uh in my life uh and i just set small goals uh and i made them um and i and i and i'm I'm happy with where I'm at today. I'm not a billionaire and I'm not the CEO of the company. Um, but, you know, uh, I married a school teacher. I got four kids and and uh, they all have Christmas presents, you know, on Christmas morning. So <laughs> I think that's about all we can ask for. Absolutely. And, and and again, it's just I'm so proud to call you a classmate. You're such a great guy. Um, but, you know, I want to wish you a happy Veterans Day coming up. And uh, hey, thanks. on time, on time, on target, never quit. All right. Right on, brother. Thank you very much for the time. You guys have a good one. All right. Chris Riley, all the way from Winona, Minnesota. Talk to you soon, buddy. All right. Thank you very much. See ya.